Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is Robin, and I am powerless, powerless, powerless. It's grateful to be here. Uh, I'm very impressed. I mean, every room has its own energy, its own feel, and uh, you guys are pretty classy, I'll tell you. Wait till you find out what you got up here talking to you. <laughs> Let's see how classy you can be then, you know. Because what you see is what you get. And if you don't like it, it's got to be your problem, not mine, you know. Because one of the beautiful things about my sobriety, listen carefully, is Robin does not mind being alone with Robin anymore. And that is a good feeling, okay? I'm I'm here to talk to you about a program of growth, growth through change, and since you can't change anybody else, it is suggested that you work on changing yourself. I mean, don't do like I did. Well, if it wasn't for them and they and it and those... No, 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 no. It's a 180-degree U-turn of the program. Don't look out there for what you're carrying around right here inside of you. And uh, I was forever blaming the world and everyone in it. And lo and behold, I was the problem from the get-go. And that was a hard pill to swallow. You know, this program is one of the most important things that they, in fact, in the first paragraph of the uh, How It Works, The word honesty is mentioned three times. Why? Because it's so important that I be honest, not only with you, but with myself. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, honest with myself uh, and others. Okay. All right. Uh, There's a beautiful lady over there, and I've got to explain something to her. When I came in the door, she complimented me on my natural black hair. <laughs> well, you know, lady, I hate to do this to you, but, you know, it comes in a bottle. And it's called Preference by L'Oreal, all right? <laughs> Bottom line is, whether you like it or not, I'm not ready to be gray. And uh, I'm sure if I didn't do this, I mean, I'd be snow white, because in three months, I'm going to be 75 years old, you know, so what's the difference? (laughs) Robin took his first drink when he was 14, his last drink when he was 45. It was downhill all the way. A grease toboggan ride straight to the pits of hell with me pouring Indian champagne on it all the way down. What is Indian champagne? Oh, it's a beautiful amber liquid. <laughs> and uh, don't spill any on you because it'll eat up your clothes and don't <laughs> let it hit the floor because it'll eat right through the wood too. But this is what we I put into my stomach. It's really a nice, Indian champagne is a nice word for white pork wine, okay? (laughs) Robin was a wino. Don't ever let me, don't ever, if you ever hear me saying anything other than that, kick me right where it'll hurt the most because that's what I was. Shut up. A wino, wino, wino. Died in the wool. Ten nonstop years on Skid Row. Ten nonstop years. Years, not weeks, months, years on Skid Row. A dirty, filthy piece of crap that the cops wouldn't even pick up because they didn't want to dirty the paddy wagons or their squad cars. All right? And uh, I stopped counting the nut houses and jails after the 50th time. I have been DOA dead on arrival more than once. It's documented. If you don't believe it, 
Go look somewhere and you might find it. I'm not going to tell you where. Um, my medical record reads like a death warrant. And uh, on and on. I mean, I could stand here and just talk for three hours just on that stuff alone. I'm not going to. But, you know, the program says that when we get up here, we're supposed to share our experience, strength, and hope. And uh, part of that is the qualification of, you know, why am I able to stand up here? And, uh, you know, Robin was one of those that was sicker than most. And I had to go the extra nine yards. When I, I didn't hit the bottom of the barrel, I went through the bottom of the barrel. And, uh, you know, DOA was not, I, I beat that rap too. And uh, <clears throat> it was pretty rotten. I mean, I spent a lot, those 10 years on Skid Row, I'd love to tell you that all the time that I was down there, I was trying to figure out a way of how I could get out of the situation, what I could do to, you know, go on living instead of dying, and uh, that would be a big lie, so I can't say it. Uh, the entire time that I was down there, it never even occurred to me that there was anything I could do to change it. I mean, I woke up, you know, I mean, we used to drink Sterno, canned heat, all that shit, and guys would wake up with dead guys who forgot to strain it and drank it anyway, and I mean, just the good life, you know. <laughs> I remember the abandoned trailers that I used to sleep in down on... Uh, somewhere on Aberdeen and something by the railroad tracks. And the cops would come by. They all knew I was in there. But it, they're sort of like a code of honor. The winos knew I was down there. They wouldn't even come into the abandoned trailer, you know, with holes in it and everything else, all patched up with cardboard. I was a class act, you know. And they'd knock on the side of the thing. <laughs> The cops would knock sometimes by throwing in uh, firecrackers, you know, and cherry bombs and all that stuff. But once in a while, a real good one would crawl in there and look at me and shake me to see if I was dead or alive. And if I was shaking too bad, they'd say, boy, you're going to die. I said, so are you. Just go over there to that box and get me that jug that's over there. And the poor guy would you'd feel sorry for me, and he would hold it for me because I couldn't hold it. Of course, none of you have ever been through that, I'm sure, but uh, I can tell by looking at you that uh, you all come from higher places. You know, it really shows. I mean, look at you, beautiful. Now, I bet you even took a bath today, you know? <laughs> In those days, I was lucky if I bathed once every six months, you know? Please believe me, you couldn't, uh, there was not many people hanging around me in those days, except other people that were in the same condition. Now, I'm getting the effect that I wanted to get. A couple of noses are starting to wrinkle up, and you're thinking, what the hell's wrong with this idiot? Why is he telling us all this shit? Again, can't he tell that we come from higher places and all this, you know? I mean, well, I got news for you. All of you, I'm going to tell you the higher places you came from, just in case you forgot. It is my duty in this world, as long as I breathe, to not allow myself or anyone else to forget from whence they came. You know those high places? I'm going to tell you what they are. We all came from the same street, whether you like it or not. We just came from different addresses. We all rode the same elevators. We just got on and off at different floors. A bottom is a bottom at whatever level you hit it. And I hope and pray for your sake that you have indeed hit bottom. Because if you haven't, your ass is going out that door. And just in case, one more little thing. This is going to offend many, but I'm here to remind you that shit, piss, and vomit smells the same in a penthouse as it does in a garbage can. Hey. And I know some of you are thinking, well, what does he know about a penthouse? He's a wino. How dare them ask a wino to come here in space? But here I am, and I'm not through yet, so. <laughs> I got news for you. I was a Skid Row wine over 10 nonstop years, but I've been in a penthouse or two. Robin doesn't talk the talk unless he's walked the walk. 
Those people are sorry to this day they ever let me in, but that's okay. I left them enough for a drink. That's the law of the street, you know. On the street, they tell you, if you snooze, you lose. If you snore, you lose more. And there's another one. You don't con a con. You don't bullshit a bullshitter. You don't hustle a hustler. And you don't snow the snowman. Look at it. Snowman? What is a snowman? <laughs> Just ask the person sitting next to you, and they'll tell you who the snowman is, all right? In this day and age, I mean, I remember, I, you know, I was a whiner. I drank Indian champagne, and uh, that's all. If somebody would come along with a handful of pretty colored things, they'd say, Robin, you want some goodies? And I'd say, where are they? Never mind, just take them. Oh, okay, well, you know, and away it go. But I never went out looking for that stuff. Well, let me tell you, the stuff that they have out there now, I am so grateful I got in here when I did, because we didn't have it back then. Not on the skid rows we had back then, but... Now I hear the young people coming in, the ones that I used to look at, and they'd say, ugh, look at this. They're still wet behind the ears. I mean, I've spilt more than they ever drank. You know, big, you know, what did I do? Big shot. And then somebody told me, Robin, take that O in shot and squeeze it real tight, and it comes out shit. So don't get too smart around here, you know. And I uh, guess I swear a little bit. And you're all looking at me like, hmm. I'm sure none of you ever heard a swear word in your life. I can tell by looking at you that everything that came out of your mouth was just lined in velvet, and there was choirs of angels singing behind you the whole time. All right, just for that, for giving me those looks that some of you just did, I'm going to ask you to do me a little favor. I mean, you don't have to. I mean, you know, the door's open, it's not locked, there's no glue on those chairs, there's no chains. So anytime you're ready, just have a nice walk, you know. But the bottom line is this. You know, the only thing they told me about this program was that if I did not take a drink one day at a time, there was no way in hell that I could get drunk. I thought you were crazy when you told me that. I didn't believe you. But anyway, back to the bad words and the bad living and all that other stuff, which I'm sure none of you have done. I want you to sit there very quietly right now and use this clean space up here between your ears and think, think, think. What did you, I mean honest engine, what did you have to do when you were out there doing your thing. Whatever it was that whistled up your skirts or blew up your pants, you know what it was. You don't have to tell me. Just think. I wouldn't embarrass you to tell you what I have done for just a drink. That's what I want you to think about, the truth, the dirty, filthy, nasty, that all of us, you know. Mae West had the right idea when she uh, named her autobiography. Goodness had nothing to do with it, because that's the story of my life. And if you sit there and think on the engine, you're going to find out that you're not here because you ate too many marshmallows. Okay, now do we understand each other? Yes, we do. But anyway, the bottom line is, for those of you that don't really know about Skid Row and all that stuff, which I'm sure there are some, I want to remind you of one Skid Row that is never going to be able to you're never going to be able to escape it as long as you're breathing. And that's that beautiful skid row between your ears. <laughs> Where I'm from, we call it the shit maker. It's got three buttons, stop, go, and fast forward, you know. And guess which button I always have to have replaced? The fast forward, because I push it, and then it's all over the walls and ceiling, and I'm thinking, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> Scary, isn't it? Scary. And the moments when all by yourself, you're in a room alone or somewhere alone, and the committee goes to work, and uh, they're having a big 
brawl up there, and the, I mean, everything in the world is collapsing. I mean, I haven't even left the house, and I'm having fights with people that don't even <laughs> exist. I am getting so angry that I'm literally, my stomach is to bile, is coming. I'm screaming at people that aren't there. And lots of times this has to do with just going to the grocery store and that cashier is going to say something to me that's going to make me so mad. Someone said, oh boy, you guys have really been busy too. Okay, all right. <laughs> boy, and I haven't even left the house. There's nobody there but me. They think, wow, you are one sick ticket buster. You better get your ass to a meeting real quick. Because you are one sick one. But anyway, of course, none of you have ever gone through anything like this. So I'm here to tell you that it's out there. Be careful. It might catch you and bite you somewhere, you know. And in case it does, you know you've been warned. Okay. Robin, you know, I, 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 I don't know how, what happened. I'd love to tell you that, you know, I finally got sick and tired of being sick and tired of being oh so sick and oh so tired of just being sick and tired, okay? But that's not true. That's not true. It would be a disservice to you and to myself and everyone else if I told you that I came charging to, no, better still, that we got the downtown office here. I called the downtown office, and I said, send the limo, I'm ready, okay? <laughs> and, of course, they told me what I could do with myself and my limo, you know. Oh, in those days, I was really serious. I'd find out where the nearest meeting was, or no, better still, I'd call them up and say, someone, I need to talk to someone, and in those days, if people would really come out to see you, and I really feel sorry, I feel sorry for them now, I didn't then, because the only reason I wanted them to come and see me was because I, I mean, I would have won Academy Awards all over the place if you could have seen me working on these two poor guys that really were there to help someone and I just did my number on them before they left they had you know I had enough for a jug I had enough for this Jesus. I used to go to meetings this is honest engine come on now get over yourselves you can laugh I don't care you know? Go to meetings, and real seriously, I'd sit there holding on to the chair for fear that I was going to fall off. And I'd say, okay, that one over there is good for a quarter. That one will pop for some cigarettes. Maybe that one will pay for a flop. None of you know what a flop is, do you? Oh, no. Of course not. No. Especially those gentlemen over there and over there. <laughs> they don't know what flops are. Okay, all right. Well, I do. It's a 50 quarter, anywhere from a quarter to 75 cents a night for a cot to sleep in under cage, wire cages and all that jazz. You've got to know that there is another world out there, people, and you're missing a lot. I mean, there is, you know, this is wild life out on the fast lane, you know, where you stand in line, a soup line, just to get a ticket to go to a... Oh, God. You have to eat their slop, take an ear beating... So that they'll give you a ticket so you can go get a bed somewhere where they give you a mattress just crawling with bed bugs and every other kind of shit. And then they make you take a shower and they delouse you. And then you're going to sleep on a mattress that's full of bed bugs, you know. So what's the difference? Why do they do it? I love doing this to you. It's not nice, but, you know, I only have one story. I only have one story, and that's the story you're going to hear. Uh, enough of that stuff, you know. Um, I spent uh, my first year in a rehabilitation workshop. One of those places where you put little doodads together. You, know? you count 20, if you can figure out what they are, you count 20 of them and you put them in a little plastic bag. Then you set it over there. Then you look at it and you think, what am I doing? Someone falls out over here, they're having a seizure. Over there, someone's talking to somebody that's not there. <laughs> this happened at the Jewish Vocational Service Rehabilitation Workshop. God love those people. They saved my life. I didn't know my behind from nothing. 
And I used to show up there every morning at 8 o'clock. And my counselor would look at me and says, Robin, what's wrong? I'd say, nothing. He says, uh, you look like you slept in your clothes. I said, I did. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, and I thought, boy, this dodo doesn't know anything. When you're out on the streets, you don't take off your clothes and put on your jammies to sit in a garbage can. I mean, if you got to run and cops are coming, you can't run with no gloves on. You leave them on. He says, uh, Robin, you're supposed to take your clothes off before you go to bed. I said, bed? He says, you do sleep in a bed, don't you? I said, no, sir. He says, Robin, why? We better go up to my office and talk. And then I get up there and I thought, okay, here we go. Same thing all over again. Why don't you sleep in a bed? I said, this dodo has never fallen out of bed and busted his head open, has he? I said, sir, if you're laying on the floor, there's nowhere to fall. So I sleep on the floor with my clothes on. He says, no, we got to change all that. To make a long story short, those people showed me how to start bathing, personal hygiene. Of course, none of you ever had any problem with personal hygiene. None of you ever wet your pants or did the other stuff or anything like that. I know you didn't because I can tell by looking at you, but I did. I did it all the time. And he could tell because I'd come in, sometimes my shoes would be on the wrong foot. He says, Rob, and they taught me how to brush my teeth, take showers, put my clothes right side in and right side out. The shoes on the right foot, it was unbelievable. I spent a whole year there, a whole year there. Ugh. And somehow or other, uh, I, at the north side of Alan Oaks Club, 5519 North Broadway, across from St. Edith's Church, I got my first year. I do not remember my first year. There's a lady over there that knows quite a bit about it because she was right there with me. I promised her I wouldn't tell you what she's done, but I'll let her tell her own story. And, uh, and of course, this other lady over here in that beautiful top, she's responsible for me being in Chicago, the one with 40 years over there. I think she's so smart. You only all, you know, she and I used to do a brother and sister act in Denver many years ago. <laughs> This is during the covered wagon days, and uh, <laughs> I, you don't want to know what I know about her, but she's the grand lady of AA in Oak Park now. Yeah. But anyway, we have fun with each other. You know what? This laughter that you're giving me, some of you, it's really nice. <laughs> it's really nice to hear, because listen, you know, that's, that's part of the miracle. Angel children, that's part of the miracle. We're laughing with each other instead of at each other. And that is a good feeling. It is for me. You might think it's a crock, but I don't. I don't. Because all the things that I thought were should be flushed down the toilet are now life-saving little tricks that I use every single day. Because, hey, you know what? If you don't, nobody else can or Real. And you know, and they told me, you know, it's a very simple thing, this business of sobriety. All you got to do is don't take a drink and uh, go to meetings, uh, read the big book, work the steps, get a sponsor. Oh, I would have loved to have had pictures of the faces of some of the people I asked to sponsor me. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, they had all kinds of ailments, and uh, they were going to get shipped off on a wild boat to China. <laughs> God, I felt sorry for them. But there was one. There was one grand lady of AA that uh, she saw me, and she thought, "This is what I need to get myself feeling better." <laughs> All she had to do was look at me, and she knew she didn't have a problem in the world. She went to the big gay meeting in the sky about uh, two years ago. That was Cecilia. And she tried her damnness. She even locked me up in one of her mansions in the servants' quarters for a week one time, trying to sober me up. And then I figured out how to crawl out through the window, and that was the end of that. She had me, she took me to 
One time she took me to Reed Zone and dropped me off, so they locked me up. And when she got home, I was sitting on the front steps <laughs> waiting for her. That's the way you do it. <laughs> oh. All right, you know why you're here, and I know why I'm here. And uh, it was a bumpy ride. Mine was no worse than anybody else's. It's all a matter of degree, you know. Like I said, the bottom is the bottom at whatever level you hit it. And whether it's upstairs, downstairs, or in the middle, pain is pain. You know, all those beautiful feelings that come out of up here, for me anyway, I'm sure you've all experienced them and to various degrees, but you all understand what they're about. Because this thing up here, what it tells me most of the time is reminds me of beautiful feelings like self-loathing, gloom, misery, despair. But it's no longer where is the next one coming from. And at one point, Angel Children, that's all I could think of. Never mind food, lodging, clothes, whatever. I used to lay on the street, cut my legs covered with wine sores. I couldn't even walk half the time. I'd have to crawl around on my knees. And uh, it was not nice. But the this disease, you know, this disease, it's cunning, baffling, and powerful. And the alcoholic who drinks it, or the drug, <clears throat> drug addict who takes it, becomes cunning, baffling, and powerful. Think of all the scheming and scamming, of all the chump chain behavior. Someone told me that once. You know, that, that's what got you in here. Chomp change behavior, scheme and scam, and think you know so much you don't know, doodly squat, okay? And we've all been there in one way or another, various degrees, but we've all been there. Different environments and all that jazz, but we've been there. And I keep hammering away at it so that you'll think of where you've been. Because angel children, the day I forget where I came from, my ass is going back out there too, and I really, really, at this point in time, I really don't think I need to do it again. I may, you know, but uh, right now, this moment, standing up here in front of you, screaming and squalling, it, 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 I, I don't think I have to worry about it as long as I'm in here. But it's when I leave these rooms and go out there into the world that I have to take what goes on in here with me. I can't leave it behind. And I never, never in my wildest audio or visual hallucination did I dream that someday I'd be saying all this crap to you, but here it is, because it happens to be the truth. I'll never forget the first time I asked, I think it was Cecilia, I said, what am I going to tell them when I talk? She says, I don't care what you tell them, just tell them the truth, no matter what it is. And furthermore, I just have to think of something. Now i got something to be mad at you about. You know, all of you that think that just because I'm a wino and all that jazz that I have no, that I'm lower than you know, that bull, you know what, and uh, because I talk and maybe swear once in a while, you know, I just remembered something. And I'm going to throw it right in your face. The promises. I got the promises to back me up. I just remember, you know. And uh, <laughs> might as well throw it at you because you might be able to use it sometime when you're blabbing a mile a minute and don't know what's coming out of your mouth. The promises says right there very clearly, no matter how far down the scale you have gone, you will see where your experience can benefit others. And that's what I'm here to tell you. My experience can benefit anybody who wants it. Nobody wants it, but that's all right. My experience is still there. All right. Somebody in here needs to hear this next little pearl of wisdom I'm going to drop on you. One of the things, uh, you know, when, when I was talking about reading the big book and working the steps and all that, they told me, they said, Robin, you know, you're going to experience 
the joy of living. And I thought, hey, that sounds okay. Because, I mean, I used to hear a lot of people, they'd stand up there, happy, joyous, free, and it's ugh. I don't know what planet you live on, but I ain't never seen any of that stuff, you know. And that's a little too high in the sky for me. I think it's great if you can, achieve, you know, try to point in that direction. But I thought joy of living, that's closer to the ground. You know? I can deal with that, but that happy, joyous, I thought, no, 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 no. So anyway, um, remember that... Uh, that uh, Rehabilitation workshop I was telling you about. Let's go back to that. I spent a year there. And then this Department of Vocational Rehabilitation counselor, he called me into his office and he says, Robin, you've been in that JBS for a year now. It's time we sent you back to school. And I went like, what? I said, don't you, wait, 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 just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. Don't you understand? I graduated from school 31 years ago. I have brain damage it's so bad that when they hook me up to one of those machines, it blows up. I can't even read one paragraph and learn one word, even if I read it 35 times. Don't you understand? I have brain damage. Don't you understand? I'm too old. Don't you he didn't crack a smile, he didn't move, he did nothing. He just looked at me and says, okay, Robin, no school, no money. I said, oh, oh, when do I start, sir? When do I start? Yeah. I wasn't ready to go out and hustle the streets at that time, you know. I mean, I just had barely made it through this thing, and I was still shaking and quaking in my boots. And So anyway, to make a long story short, I went to, they had just built, this is, now how's this for, for unbelievable? In mysterious ways, his miracles to perform, whatever that means to you. On the very corner of Wilson and Racine, they had built a college, Truman College. That's where I sobered up on Wilson Avenue, north side, worst skid row on the north, north side there was, and I used to sleep right on that corner says, you're going back to school, and we're going to send you to Truman College. I said, are you okay? <laughs> Just make sure I get my check, okay? <laughs> I didn't care. At that time, I thought, anything beats a blank, and I'll play along with this. He was actually a beautiful guy. He stuck with me for years and years. I remember he helped me get my first above-ground apartment. <laughs> My last five years, I lived in a dungeon basement with the rats, the garbage, and the cockroaches. I used to have parties with the cockroaches. They'd fall off the ceiling, and they'd land on my table, and I'd take a little drop of wine and pour it on them and say, here, join the party, you know. And they'd just flip over and die, you know. And I'd keep on, you know. Pretty soon I was hearing tinkling pianos and people laughing. And and then pretty soon it got so bad that I couldn't turn it off, and I had to take my head and whack it against this brick wall until it would bleed, because I couldn't snap out of that fantasy. It can get pretty bad sometimes, people. I'm sure none of you have ever done that, I'm sure, but it can get pretty bad. You get into that fantasy, and you, you don't want to come back. You have to literally beat yourself to come back. But anyway, I went to Truman College. It's a two-year college. Took me two and a half years, they, and I was quitting every other day. And every time I'd open my mouth in bad those days, if you think I'm bad now, in those days when I'd open my mouth, black clouds of smoke would come out, and my ears and everything else. And I'd always get sent to the counselor's office. <laughs> this man's language is unbelievable. And I'd get lectures and this and that and the other, and then. He'd give me for, well, why didn't you show up? Why did you leave? Why this? I said, you know what? I can't do this. You're going to do it with your life. They put a guy with a hook by the door, and every time I go by, he just hook me and pull me back in. You know. Graduation at Truman College. After two and a half years, I finally graduated. And wait just a minute. I 
we were going to have the graduation service in the cafeteria because it was a brand new little community college. And so we were in our standing up out in the hallways, getting ready to go in, in your caps and gowns and feeling like you're really somebody, you know. And this girl in front of me turns on. She says, "Who's standing up for you?" I said, "Standing up for me." Yeah. Someone in the family. I said, family? She says, yeah. We all have someone standing up for us, our family. I said, okay, well, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Don't move. I'll be right back. I ran out on the street, which was right on Skid Row. And there's Richard the wino that I drink with all the time. I said, Richard, you're going to be my brother. Put that bottle away. And then here comes a street social worker, and I said, you are going to be my sister. Pull that skirt down, and, uh, you know, let's get this show on the road. Come on. And I told her, I said, don't you dare let him pull out that bottle while we're in there, you know. <laughs> so sure enough, she kept him quiet, and she pulled her skirt down and tried to be a lady and all that jazz. And <laughs> they called my name, and Richard, yay, Robin, and <laughs> Whether you believe this or not, that is a true story. I don't think anyone could make that one up. It was true. All right. So I said, okay, that's it. I got my little AA degree, whatever that's, 60 credit hours. You know. So that's good enough for that. And then it's a little voice. Do you know anything, you know anything about a little voice in your head? Well, in fact, there's two of them. The one that tells you what you want to hear and the one that tells you what you don't want to hear. And uh, it said, you know, uh, shouldn't stop now. You should keep going. I said, what do you mean keep going? Are you crazy? I said, I don't have any money. I can't, you know. Blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, they have things like Pell Grants and all that stuff. and Won't pay for you. And I said, yeah, right. I said, get out of here. I don't want to hear about it. I've had it with this school business. It was pure torture. Next thing you know, I'm walking up and down the halls of Northeastern Illinois University, which is the next logical step because it's a state college, too. It used to be the state teacher's college. So here I am at Northeastern. Zoom, 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 zoom. And believe it or not, I was keeping body and soul during the day and going to school halftime at night. And that was my higher power with this caustic sense of humor. Because I was so tired at the end of each day that all I could do was pass out, wake up, do it over again, pass out, wake up, do it over again. And I graduated. I got my Bachelor of Science in Psychology. <laughs> I was going to go out and conquer the world, you know. I remember when we first, when I first sobered up in the first five years of my sobriety, everybody would talk about becoming a counselor on alcoholism or substance abuse or whatever they called it. Back then it was counselor. You know, and I thought, I don't like that. And, and, but it was really funny because anyone with 10 days of sobriety and uh, a high school diploma was trying to become a counselor with, you know. And so it was like a standing joke. And I said, I am not going to be a counselor on alcoholism. I am going to be a guidance specialist. People would just look at me and say, boy, you are sick, you know. Anyway, I did that work that I needed to do to get that degree. And this time I said, you're not going to get me with another graduation thing. So I ran down to the registrar office and I said, where is that? Damn diploma, give it to me and I'm out of here. She said, yeah, you're not going to be so. I said, just give it to me, I'm out of here. And then she said, here it is, get the hell out of here. And so I went screaming out of there, talking to myself, never will I see another corridor of a school, blah, 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 blah. Next thing you know, the voice is saying, you know, Robin, one more little turn of the screw. I said, screw you. Don't even go there. I don't want to hear it. And besides, you know, there's, there's no money for that. That's graduate work. And he said, no. Why don't you pick up the phone and find out? So I called up these people, the Pells or whoever they were, the government. And they said, you don't pay for graduate work, do you? She says, no, we don't. I said, thank you. She says, wait. 
I said, what now? She says, take any school you want and we will give you a student loan. That was it. I said, you've got to be kidding. She said, no. God, I don't believe this. I don't believe this. I don't believe this. Robin got his master's in human services. <laughs> and this is a big, I said it very quietly because I still don't believe it myself. And the funny part of it is that, you know, here's a twist that I never expected, but my life has been so full of twists that I was the biggest twist that ever came along. But <laughs> the bottom line was I didn't expect all of this, and I don't often tell it. So uh, I'm telling you tonight because someone needed to hear it. And uh, so here I am, and I'm thinking, what do I do now, you know? And uh, I have my master's and all that jazz. And I said, well, I'll show them. I, now, how's this for ego? Pure, unadulterated, egomaniac with an inferiority complex, but heavy on the egomaniac. <laughs> this poor guy that was, you know, in the program with me at that time, we were close, I said, you know what, I need to be financially stress-free so that I can concentrate on my career as a guidance specialist. And he looked at me and says, oh? He says, uh, why are you telling me? I says, because you've got money, that's why. <laughs> he says, and what do you suggest? I think you should lend me enough money to be financially stress-free for one year so I can take care of business. Oh, okay. Well, he was smart. He says, instead of giving me the money, which he could have, he said, I'll co-sign a loan for <laughs> knowing that I'd have to pay it back. I didn't know that at the time. I mean, when it comes to finances, I mean, that kind of finances, I'm pretty dodo, you know. And so I said, okay, whatever, whatever. And here I am, printing cards, sending out announcements and everything else, you know. Robin White Spear, M.S. Ta-da! And I waited. And I waited, and I waited, and my higher power was laughing his head off, you know, just laughing his head off. And finally, I thought, what the hell's going on here? And then that little voice says, Robin, the program says that you can't hold on to what you got unless you give it away, and you're trying to sell it. I thought, uh-oh. I said, but that was 11 years of school. And he's laughing even harder. Because uh, that was the only way Robin got 11 years of sobriety. Because he was too knocked out and drug out to even think of anything other than just keeping body and soul together. The thought of a drink never even occurred to me. And that was his plan. So I threw in the towel. I laughed. And I said, okay. And I took the three diplomas. And you know where the potty is, the throne, whatever you call it? Right here on the wall, all three of them. People would ask for the washroom, and they'd tell them it's in there, and they'd come out, and they'd have sort of funny look on their face. Robin, there's some things on the wall there. I said, yeah, I know. I put them there. He says, are those real? I said, you bet your bottom bet the 11 years of my life just thrown down the drain. <laughs> I said, no, actually, I said, that's the only place where I'd have a chance to look at them. And when I sit down, I just say, oh, okay, not bad for the wino from Skid Row. And, you know, and, you know, this is the same wino from Skid Row, okay, nonstop years worth, that the best and the worst of the psychiatric and medical profession said, let the son of a bitch die. He's better off dead. He doesn't stand the chance of a snowball in hell of ever sobering up. Guess what? I'm here, and they're gone. Okay. <laughs> now let me tell you that... <laughs> That's a good feeling. That's a good feeling. So, you know what? 
What that, what that tells me, I don't know what it tells you, but hopefully you will take this with you. And that's very simply this. As long as there's life, there is hope. George Eliot, the poet, says it so beautifully. It is never too late to be what you might have been. So if you aren't quite there yet, don't give up now, you know. <laughs> Pull yourself up by those bootstraps and just keep right on trucking. Because it's there, but you got to. I tell people, if you think those steps, you know, up on the board, if you think those their steps is a blueprint for living, but if you think those steps are going to jump off that piece of paper and hug you and squeeze you and tell you that everything's all right, you're full of it because they're not going to do that. You're going to bust your ass just like everybody else in this room who's got a program that they're reaping the benefits thereof. You know, I told you about this joy of living. You know, when I thought uh, that that was, you know, that joy of living was some pie up in the sky, it's not. The joy of living and the ability to gain this for yourself isn't out there anywhere. It's right there inside each and every one of you. And it's your own heart. You know, the joy of living, you know what, know what it really is? It's your hard-earned, painful, painful sharing that hard-earned, painful experience, strength, and hope with someone less fortunate than yourself. That is the joy of living. Reaching out and touching somebody. That is the joy of living. I used to think it was cars, furs, diamonds. It ain't that at all. It ain't that at all. And when you leave here today, if anybody asks you, you tell them for me. How does it work? How does it work? How does it work? Tell them for me. Don't take a drink one day at a time. Get your ass to one of these damn dope meetings. Say one word, help in the morning. Two words, thank you at night. And I don't care if you've just had a day. Federal Express, straight from the pits of hell, where everything you touch turns to you know what. Let's get it down to the nitty gritty, the here and now. Tonight, when your head hits that pillow, if you have not had a drink or any other mood-altering substance, you had better say thank you. Because whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you accept it or not, at that moment, mood-altering substance free, you are a miracle, a winner a living, breathing power of example, and no one, no one, no one can take that away from you except you. God bless you and thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.